Welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the Drexel University Picture Gallery. Today, our guest is essayist and author Adam Gopnik. Adam Gopnik is a longtime and much acclaimed staff writer for the New Yorker magazine and the author of three books, most recently, Angels and Ages, a comparative study of Abraham Lincoln and Charles Darwin. Adam Gopnik, welcome to the Drexel Interview. Pleasure to be here, Paula. Thank you for having me. Um, I am a longtime admirer of your essays uh, for The New Yorker. And um, it seems to me you have a distinctive voice. I'm sure you've been told this many times. It's a mix of wit and sentiment, which I am using that term in the best sense, mm -hmm. in, the, in the sense, the 18th century sense, of a certain kind of feeling. And um, I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about how you cultivated that voice. Did it, was there a point at which you fe felt it took, um, or was it a very gradual sure, process? Sure, that mix of my, my, my critics call it a mix of pedantry and mawkishness, <laughs> I, I suppose. <laughs> yes, and to be honest with you, it was a very specific moment. Uh -huh. It's rare you can answer a, really? a general okay. question with a yeah. specific uh, instance. I was, it was 1981, and I had come down with my then girlfriend, now wife, of many years from Canada to New York and I wanted to be a writer. That's more than anything else what I wanted to be. But I had been brought up as an academic. And that was the background of my family and I have five brothers and sisters. I'm the only one without a PhD. And that was, and you learn a certain kind of academic style when you're an academic and I was sufficiently in New York to go to graduate school, though I really just wanted to write. And I couldn't break out of, and I knew that I couldn't break out of the habits of uh, graduate student style, that is, uh, argumentative, pugnacious style built around butts, built around contention. And I was in my, uh, in my little, our little tiny basement room once, and I wrote down the simple declarative sentence, I am a student at the Institute of Fine Arts, and I work part-time at the Frick Art Reference Library, which was true. And it just was declaration and uh, proper nouns. And I know it sounds like an absurd sentence to have built your entire life on, but when I wrote that sentence, I thought, oh, that's more like writing. That's like a voice. It's slower, it's particular, it's faux naïf in a certain way, and, and so on. And I knew I could start building on the foundation of that simple declaration. And that process began at that moment, and I had to learn, I had to unlearn a lot. I had to unlearn all the things you learn as a graduate student. And I had to learn to write with ands. Good writing is really done not with contentious but but with inclusive ands, and learning to string sentences together with the little needle and thread of ands, of sequence, of narrative, of chronology, was, took me a long time to, to learn. But that was a specific moment when I, for the first time, beat, you know, Chekhov says somewhere that he had spent his whole life beating the peasant out of himself. Well, I've spent my whole life beating the graduate <laughs> student out of myself, and that's, that's when it, it began. It's a terrific story. You know, they say that if, it's good you didn't write the dissertation, yeah. because then you are absolutely useless after that's, that. That's right. That's but right. But that's so interesting. You really had to go backward then, in Absolutely, a sense. And, and, and going backwards. <laughs> I've been going backwards ever since. But in, in terms of the other thing that your question implies, and I, I'm, obviously I like that way of looking at my own work, is that... I'm an essayist, and what an essay is is simply, it's a kind of writing traditionally in, in, in its practice today, where ideas and emotions are in some kind of constant dialogue, where you have an idea in order to evoke an emotion, where you evoke an emotion in order to provoke an idea. And where in academic or critical writing, it's a sequence of ideas in, in the novel or the short story, it's a sequence of emotions. The essay has to oscillate back and forth between those two things. So in a, in a funny way, it's partly uh, sensibility, voice, who you are, but it's also partly what you do. And that's one of the things that I think the essay does. No, that's a wonderful definition of the essay. But, but actually, as an essayist, you write two kinds of essays. You write the personal, uh, familiar essay, mm -hmm. which usually starts with something very small and personal and opens into some existential insight. Right. And then you write a sort of a critical uh, feature type piece, right. intellectual feature, as I would call it. And they seem to oscillate, perhaps. I wonder if they inform each other and whether you self-consciously 
alternate between these two kinds of essay. Reminds me of Philip Larkin, the great grumpy British uh, poet and critic said about Miles Davis, he said, he does the yelping frenetic stuff and then he does the slow mawkish <laughs> stuff and I hate them both. Oh. But it's true that I do the yelping frenetic <laughs> stuff and then I do the slow mawkish stuff. The thing about doing the, um, the uh, what I sometimes call them comic sentimental in exactly your sense essays or personal essays, uh, is that you can't sort of provoke them. I, they tend to be <coughs> excuse me, readers' favorites, and they tend to be my favorites as well when they, when they work. But you can't force them. You know, it's funny actually, Paula, because when I was in Paris, for instance, at the end of our five years in Paris, we were debating whether to stay or go, stay in Paris or go back to New York. And I had the idea, I don't know how to drive. And I thought, well, I'll take driving lessons in Paris, and that will make a funny piece. And then I was, oh, that's terrible, because then everything I had done up to that point had been, in some sense, unprovoked. We tried to join a gym, tried to have a baby, did have a baby. All of those things that happened in some sense naturally. And once you start sort of gumming up or gunning up or flogging your own experience to produce stories, boy, I think readers spot that instantly as shtick. You know, even writers that we all enjoy, like Dave Barry, for instance, you know that there's the, the primary impetus on Dave Barry, who's a wonderful writer, is to write the column, to get that week's column done. And the kind of thing I do, I'm not skilled enough of, at that kind of humor to do it in order to get the, that week's uh, piece done. So basically, I sort of do the critical pieces, the ones that you described, in the long interstices between the personal essays. And there's sort of the you know, styrofoam packing chips between those. I guess one of the other challenges, and this is something that I think that uh, a lot of writers don't see clearly, is, is that they're different sort of enterprises. In a first-person piece, the crucial thing is that the I who begins the piece has to be in a different state at the end of the piece than he or she was at the beginning. In a third-person piece, it's a really about the subject, and it's a form of personal expression. That is, you try and write something that is, however nakedly or transparently or however well-disguised it is, is in some way about your experience. If you write about um, Dr. Johnson, I did a piece about mm -hmm. Samuel Johnson a while ago, and obviously that piece was about struggling to make sense of what should a critic do? Um, who are our father figures? A lot of, um, in a certain way, kind of intimate stuff involved in that. But it has to be all declared through the vehicle of another person in someone else's story. But I'm writing, I, I did one, you know, it wasn't really a personal essay, but it, was, it had notes of that. I did a piece about reading uh, cookbooks the other day, which right. was in a funny way issue. about, yeah, yeah it's a funny way about my mother, really, about, you know, about my mother, who was a wonderful scholar and scientist, but also a great cook, and what she taught me, and I'm doing a whole collection now of uh, pieces about food, or kind of, and they'll be, uh, I think that will have some more of that. So that may be your way into, exactly. now that through, the children are too old, you'll go to the food. <laughs> I'll become a fat man, <laughs> I'll, I'll do it in the way, through yeah. that, through that vehicle. Whereas something like uh, Angels and Ages, the book about Darwin and Lincoln, mm -hmm. is, you know, pure, yelping, frenetic, um, uh, pseudo-intellectual me on the page. Okay, I want to get to that, I don't right. think pseudo-intellectual, <laughs> but before we do, I want to speak about your p period in France and, and Paris to the Moon, the collection Oh, I wasn't of, goading you on, Paula, uh, to the contemporary one. I love talking about the old ones. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're all three, there's so much we could say about all three of them. I, I love all three of them. But uh, Paris to the, uh, to the Moon um, is a collection of essays, I guess some of them altered and embroidered and added to, from your uh, your essays in The New Yorker. And um, you spent five years in France, and uh, I, I assume that The New Yorker sent you there or you requested to go. It was more the second than the first. We said, my wife and I had always had the dream mm. of going to live in Paris mm. from when we were kids, really. We had run away from home when we were still in our teens and gone to Paris for a week, and we said, someday we'll get back there. And then we had a little a baby, Luke, who's the real hero of the story. And uh, we said, if we're gonna go, we're going to go now. And I went to the then editor of The New Yorker, Tina Brown, and said, I want to go to Paris. And to her, out of the generosity and kindness of her heart, she said, oh, okay, you can write for Paris, from Paris for us. I think she couldn't see the possible point or purpose of anybody wanting to be in Paris. She because was, she's uh, British. Because she's British. <laughs> and because it's true that at that point, mm. uh, Paris seemed like a terrible backwater. London, if you remember, in the 90s was where everything was happening. New Labour, cool Britannia. New York was where everything was happening. And Paris was a bit of a, of a cultural backwater. I, I can see your knowing that there would be material to write about. The question I would ask you also is, did you know that the French would be so funny in we, advance? Uh, you know, to answer that honestly, I did have in the back of my mind certain examples. James Thurber, who's one of my favorite writers, has been since I was a little boy growing up in Philadelphia, wrote in ways that are very funny about French experience. A.J. Liebling, 
who mm. became a hero of mine later on, another New Yorker writer like Thurber, uh, did as well. So I did have in the back of my mind sort of the way if you're a stand-up comedian and you go in an airplane, you think there'll probably be some material in here, the food, the stewardesses, whatever. Uh, you, you, so I did have a little bit of that sense. But the thing about humor of all kinds is, is that it's only good when it's simple relation. In other words, the stuff that people found funny in, that, in the book, mm. going to join a gym, as I said before, or having a baby, None of that stuff, truly none of that was guide up. None of that was, that was all just straight reporting of oh, what happened. Oh, I, I believe you. Of what it happened. felt that way. I wanted uh, three of my favorite pieces, and uh -huh. I just want to know what your response to this is. I loved the, the piece about French cuisine, which the I thought was just... The crisis in French the cooking. The crisis right. in French cooking. You also had one about your wife's giving birth at a maternity clinic right. in, in Paris, Paris, which was Priceless, and then the two cafes, the Café mm -hmm. de Fleur and, oh, and the, the, uh, the Jumago. Du Mago. I, and that was <laughs> struck me as one of the most brilliant pieces that you've written. Well, that's nice of you to say. For me, that piece, the mm. two cafes, and I haven't, it's not like I stay up at night rereading these things, but by, from memory, mm. is for me um, the kind of piece we were talking about before where I sort of had to produce something, and there's a certain kind of harried virtuosity about it. You know, put two unlike things together, make it happen. The one about having the baby in Paris is always a favorite of mine, I think, of, of all, everything I've done. Because though I hope it had a, a funny service and it just was narrating what actually happened, if you remember, you know, the, the choix de roi, the king's choice, everyone said we had because we're having a little girl after a boy <laughs> and all of that. So, it's, like for our, our audience, so uh, choix de roi is it's the, the king's, king's choice. choice. It's, and it's a French term when you're having a baby girl after a boy. And I was going all around Paris trying to get someone to explain it to me because every time we said, oh, we're having a little girl, I said, oh, it's the choix de roi. <laughs> what did it mean? Well, it means because in the, in the old dynastic days of the French monarchy, um, if you had a king, if you had a boy first, that meant that the kingdom was secured. And then you had a girl who you could bargain with as a bride <laughs> with other kings. I, not something I was very likely to be doing either on the... And yet the taxi sixth drivers around, yes, and everybody was Everybody saying. knew it. And, and it became a reflection of sort of the deep culture of France. I like that piece uh, particularly because... I hope in a fairly uh, lighthearted way. It was really the tying together what for me were the themes of the book, that is, that we live in a world where simultaneously everything that we do and say and eat and read is parsed in incredible detail in a cultural way, like having a baby. Having a baby in Paris was sort of the black to having a baby in New York. In New York, everybody dresses in white, literally white lab coats, <laughs> make it a very medicinal experience. Paris, all the obstetricians wear black silk, that's true. <laughs> They smoke. Because it's chic. It's chic, and they make it into a purely sexual experience, having a baby, as indeed it is. It's not a medical experience. It's a consequence of sex. So in one way, it's, the experiences are totally unlike, and yet in some other deeper way, there are universal, constant human experiences, of which having a baby is the major one. So that constant oscillation between the universal human and the particular national is sort of what the book is about. And that, for me, was a way in which those two things, for me, kind of came together nicely. Oh, well, I think they, you did a fabulous job. Um, your second book, Through the Children's Gate, um, was written after your return. You returned from Paris. You were five years there, 1995 to 2000. 2000. And then it, you wrote this in 2005? 2000. Yeah, it comes out, it came out, I think, in 2006, but okay. it's really about the five years from 2000 to 2005. So it, it pa you pass through the 9-11 disaster, mm -hmm. and that is a focal point of this book. Um, now, this is very much a book about your family. I mean, there are other things going on as well, but uh, did you feel when you were writing this book, you say now that you don't like to write about your children because they've reached a certain age. Did you feel writing this book that you were ever using material that was out of bounds or could be dubious? Or were there pieces that you had thought of writing about that you didn't because you thought it would upset your family? You know, I, in a way, I, I, I don't know how to put this well. Of course, you know, there are things, um, my son Luke has various moments in his life has suffered from anxieties that I wouldn't write about because they're his in, in a way, so is my daughter Olivia. On the other hand, I thought, you know, of all the experiences of my life, and that's very much what this book is about, having children and raising children has been by far the most intense, has been by far the most significant, by far the most complicated, by far the most meaningful. So not to write about it out of some false sense of decorum was in a way to betray my readers. That is, what readers want from a writer is all your stars out. They want 